Stephen, thank you so much for sitting down with us. This is fantastic. You've been so generous with your time. I appreciate it. We are here to tell your story so that passionate, ambitious people can learn from what you've seen, what you've done, what you've experienced. Uh, but if I can, I'd like to set the stage a little bit. You got it. We're here in, in Tampa. You invited us down to your offices. Yes, this is it. Incredible. If I were to look within these walls, you have a title, uh, a label that you would mm -hmm. go by as Pastor Stephen, yep, something like that's that. That's right. Uh, if we were to rewind or look at other places, you'd have some other titles of lead singer, songwriter, father, husband, these kinds of things. But there was a time where none of those labels were you, a time before all that. Take me back there to young, title-less Stephen. Yeah. What was growing up like? Statusless Stephen, outcast Stephen. I, mean, I think exactly. there's a lot of titles that we would put on, I put on myself. Mm -hmm. I think we as humans do. And um, so growing up was very, very difficult. I was ADHD, which is just a fancy way of saying I couldn't focus on a singular thing. And my energy level was so high, it was an annoyance to everyone that I was around. To the, and we coupled that with um, a, a father. We, we traveled a lot. And my dad's job took us to new cities. So in 12 years, the first 12 years of my life, I live in 12 different houses. Wow. I, you know, every year or two my father who worked for a corporation would go and train a set of people and when they felt they were adequately serviced he would move on to a new city mm -hmm. which means packing up the boxes and moving and so that uh really made it to where i didn't have a lot of friends because for me it just kind of felt like why mm -hmm. you know we would pick up and move anyway so the deeper or the closer that i got it just was in vain to the point where you know i i my best friend was my brother paul mm -hmm. still is and we would just uh, have each other and that's about it so with those two powers combined it led, it led for a very lonely adolescence mm -hmm. so coming into moving to florida i was 13 years old okay and my father finally said that's enough we're good we're going to stay here that's a that's a that even that time of life for in every human is a very transitional time. Mm -hmm. And so all of that combined, I think it led me into having very low self-esteem, mm -hmm. wearing all black, going to school, sitting on the back row, sitting in the back of the bus, not because I was cool, <laughs> trust me, I was not, not because I was trying to be a punk rocker or whatever the case might be, but it was simply because I just felt inadequate. I felt mm -hmm. titleless. And I felt, uh, you know, much like an outcast. I think even early on, I thought I was going into the military. My dad took me to West Point. I thought for sure I was, but I think that the allure was not to guns or generals or status or whatever. I think the allure for me was something bigger than myself that I was a part of that, that I felt complete in. So in that transitional time, somewhere around the end of high school, beginning of college is is a, a band comes into the picture. What, what was your first interest in music? Do you have a, do you have that memory? Is that clear to you? Well, I mean, I think all growing up, music was a big part of my, both sets of my families, as far as my, you know, grandparents on both sides, they were all very musical. They all loved to sing. Hmm. My aunt, you know, studied opera and was an opera singer in Kelowna, Canada, as well as Chicago. I, you know, my, my grandfather was, was known to play 12 different instruments. Wow. My father was a, was a worship leader in, in Michigan for our short stint there. Uh, so, I mean, definitely different moments of life. And I, I definitely gravitated towards music. Mm -hmm. It's not like somebody was like, you have a gift. It was not like that at all. It almost felt natural to me. It almost felt like normal. Mm -hmm. So about the age of 16, 17, my brother and I would put together a little band and we were playing guitar and we tried to form a band. You know, I tried to form a band in high school that didn't work out too well. I tried to do this and that, but it was more of a social life to, than, than gotcha. anything else. It was not, we had no delusions of grandeur. Mm -hmm. We did not believe that we were God's gift to anyone's musical, you know, interest or taste or playlist by any stretch of the imagination. For us, it was just kind of a, a getaway. A so is that out. your first, you've been seeking this camaraderie, this yeah. somewhere in your life, the stability, this camaraderie, this unity, is that your first, you think, started to find it yes absolutely. represented that absolutely you know we're in this together we're sleeping in the back of a van right. and you know we're, we're we're not making enough money to to get a hotel room yeah all that definitely added to the gang mentality now you you've downplayed it but servants after god's own heart right yes was was a little bit more than just casual you did 
you played shows. We you, did. You recorded albums, right? We was did. Was it two? We did. We recorded two records, and and it was a very, uh, you know, at the time it it consumed a lot of our life mm. because that's that's the highest form of achievement that any of us had been around. Sure. Uh, especially in Winter Haven, there weren't a lot of bands that got to, you know, neighboring cities, mm -hmm. let alone Atlanta, Georgia, which was which was mind blowing for us. We couldn't believe it. Mm -hmm. And so yeah, we was definitely. Uh, that was our first taste of okay, you know, not not success. I don't want to say success. At the time, we felt like it was successful because we got a chance, but it was our first time of saying, okay, you know, this is music connects. Mm -hmm. So walk well, I me mean, because you're at this like high school to college age at this time, right, right? Right. So you can see there's some potential here, but I'm guessing that there's other things going on in in young Steven's mind of other interests, other maybes. Was there anything else you're thinking of? If this music doesn't work out, I'm gonna do. Oh, a thousand percent. I mean, so I was going to wall, wall the the hybrid of of the punk rock band into Amberlin, whatever that metamorphosis was taking mm -hmm. place. I was in college. I was going to the University of Central Florida, okay. and I knew at the time that I wanted to be um, in some type of I don't I wouldn't say ministry, but definitely like a 501c3, some type of nonprofit. Like gotcha. my dream at that age was to be the president of World Vision, which is an organization that. Um, it helps young children. Sure. I mean, just, yeah, feeds clothes, mm -hmm. gives them education. That was my dream. So at the time of my senior year of college, I was working at a place in Orlando, and it, it was a the Christian version of Habitat for Humanity. Okay. And so not that Habitat's not. I'm just saying that, that it was this hybrid of kind of like a summer camp. So mm -hmm. students would go for a week and work on Habitat for Humanity type projects mm -hmm. in their lo in local communities. Very ministry focused. Very ministry focused. So coming coming into my graduation year, graduating semester, I told the guys in, in Amberlynn at the time, and I just said, listen, guys, I'm letting you know I'm about to graduate. I've got to get a job. This is what I want to do. I want to work with this ministry. So I'm just letting you know, like there's a proverbial countdown. And if something doesn't happen, I'm out. Well, something happened about a, about Wait, you just you issued an ultimatum. Oh yeah, it's a I've, bold I've, move I've for issued... a group of what I'm going to guess are alpha male kind of guys. Yeah, like there's a lot of ultimatums throughout. <laughs> we all we all pushed on each other. Right. You know, it was it was very much well because you know we weren't making a single cent, didn't have a record label, mm -hmm. didn't have a tour lined up. Mm -hmm. You know, we had five songs on a demo that we had tracked in Georgia that was picking up a little traction, but not enough to like to warrant me like quitting my job and just you know. I, I, yeah, so, uh, but, but basically three weeks before I graduated, my boss came to me from this nonprofit and said, you're fired, like out of the blue and gave no reason. About three months ago, I actually reached out to him on email and just said, thank you for firing me. Right. And I, everything inside me wanted to ask him why, if yeah. he, you know, but I didn't, you know, he didn't I just, say, he didn't say he, I was hoping he would like kind of bring it up or Did something. Did he respond though? To yeah, he responded and said, I've watched your career. Congratulations. You know, I'm glad life worked out. And, uh, but I'm glad I didn't have to watch. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't know, you know, but if I would have taken the job, I don't know how far Amberlynn would have gotten because I would have viewed that as a, the open door into, you know, my career, into nonprofit work. Um, so, however, I graduated two weeks later to the date of graduating college. That's when we got our first offer from a, a small, well, now, I mean, not small, but a, a, a well-established indie label in Seattle called Tooth and Nail. Yep. Yeah. So, so you've made this transition. We skipped over a little bit, but Servants After God's Own Heart, you guys said the sound is not the sound that's going to make right. us. Maybe it's not what we're interested in. Maybe it's not going to make us get us where we want to go. Yes. Um, was there something about the change to Amberlynn that, that you would say made you better? Or was it really just a new focus, new sound? Well, I think if you're passionate about something, you put, you're more vested into it. You're more excited about it. Mm -hmm. You know, you've heard it said like if you you know if you find something you're passionate about, you know, and that that's your job. That that's not it's not really a job. It's not like it's going to right. work. It's just it's just exciting. That's what you want to do. And so for me, that was Amber Lynn. I, I really didn't listen at that point at that juncture. I was not listening to punk rock at all. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was my huge Radiohead phase. You know, like I was well into way into that. Um, you know, bands like Coldplay were emerging, The Stills, The Doves, you know, a lot of, I was, a Star Sailor was, was a huge influence on me at that point. And so I was really listening to a lot of UK stuff and I was done with punk rock. I mean, I you know, may have picked it up for nostalgic reasons, but I was not listening to 
you know, yeah. Blink-182 for, for fun at that point moment. Um, so, I mean, so I was passionate about Amber Lynn, and I think when you're passionate about that, I was more invested into the lyrics and into cultivating a live show and talking about branding and all this, just all these things that were just like culminating in my mind and uh, with, with these other guys, obviously. So you had this passion. This is like 02, 03, yes. you sign with Tooth and Nail, mm -hmm. and then I, I believe it's 03, blueprints for the black market yes is released right yes and i would say a huge part of kind of narrowing the focus of what amberlynn sounded like was aaron sprinkle okay. when we when we arrived to the studio in seattle washington we had nine songs you know we didn't even have a tenth song mm -hmm. but we went to go see aaron sprinkle perform a cure cover band night mm -hmm. and when we did we just were you know obviously just blown away by the cure I mean, we had, we knew who they were, but we were like, let's put one of, the, one of these songs on our record. And that's what it did. So it wasn't like we walked in to the record, you know, to saying, okay, we should put a Cure song. You know, Seattle happened to us, right. you know, we were reactive to the, our environment and Aaron Sprinkle had a massive influence on the sound and what the songs ended up being He produced like. the album. Absolutely, right. yep. So you've got this, this album release that is got to feel huge. Uh, it's got to feel like a really big wow we we kind of did something there's a there's a product we've made oh, this absolutely. thing what absolutely. was that like well i mean even just even let's just take like one step back and just even driving into seattle from the from the airport mm -hmm. and just just seeing seattle as a whole you know you got to realize that we didn't make it out of atlanta georgia you know we were just i mean we were we did like lakeland and tampa and orlando and atlanta that's it that's mm -hmm. all we'd ever known uh, for the most part, uh, as far as like on a regular basis. And so to go to Seattle, it was already as if we had made it like we were the in our lives. We, you know, because we just we we felt like, well, at least I did. And I, and I know the other guys did, too. Like, man, we cashed in a lot of chips to be to do this. Mm -hmm. You know, we left a lot of behind and we and and we said success for us was not the amount of records that we ever sold or the places that we got into success for us was saying like, we're going to leave all this behind and we're going to get into a, you know, like a van or an airplane or whatever the case might be and try our hardest. Mm -hmm. That's what success is for me in my life. And uh, so I think that's that moment of just like this surreal, it felt like a slow motion movie. We were all like crowding up at the front of the car, like, Oh my gosh, we're in Seattle, Washington. We're recording a record. We've made it no matter what else life hands us. Positively or negative, negatively, at that moment, I felt in my life, I, I pinnacled. Like, We've done it. you know, I peaked, like, right. as far as, like, success was concerned. So if, if I was to make a list as a, as a non-musician, getting signed, yeah. producing, a, producing a record, the, the last piece would be when we're going on tour. Yes. On a, on a let's call it a real tour. Yeah, a real tour. And that would come soon after, Blueprints, yeah. correct? Absolutely. With Further Seems Forever and a, a band called Movie Life. Was that a game changer going on tour? It was a game changer. I mean, there's a to it for a lot of different reasons. First off, these aren't Christian bands necessarily. Yeah. So for us, that was that was a time of for me of soul searching. Yeah. Because suddenly we were the buzz band around the industry, mm -hmm. from the CMAs to write-ups to all these things. You know, between that that ear between blueprints and never take was huge for us because we also had to look in the mirror individually and say, who are you really? Like, are you really going to stick with the Christian, Christian foundational principles that you grew up with, mm -hmm. that we all grew up with? Mm -hmm. Or, I mean, sex, drugs and rock and roll is not an exaggeration. I mean, it's, you know, stereotypes are put there for, for mm -hmm. a reason, you know, and um, it was all right there. Yeah. You know, our first exposure to cocaine, our first exposure to weed, our first exposure to women. All that was just like, there you go, just put in front of us to the point where I realized that I was way too weak to be out there. You know, I thought I was, a, a you know, I thought I had it all figured out and I have a college degree. Look at me and I'm on a sign. I'm on a well. It's it was. But to the point where I had to call my best friend, Seth Kane, and I called him and I said, listen, man, I'm not making any money. I make like twenty dollars a day on tour. We were we were actually paying to be on the road, mm -hmm. which, you know, like we were not getting paid. And Tooth and Nail had to pay these promotion promoters and all this to get on the road. Further Seems Forever is not so nice to us. They basically said they realized that halfway through that we weren't getting any money, and they they gave us some money, and they allowed they let us into their like to to um, you know to their green room. We got to share their food. They were they beautiful people. It was awesome. 
Um, but, uh, but we weren't making any money. But I called him, I said, listen, man, if you don't get out here on this next tour, like I see where pride is taking me. I see the route. I see where, I, you know, like the world is like seducing me and I'm giving in, I'm letting you know that I can see myself. So if you don't get out here, I'm about to change into a person I'm not gonna recognize a year from now. So I wanna talk more about those, some of those challenges, the things that you found kind of a, a salt on your identity. This is new, I'm, I'm, this is uncharted waters for me, but to put it in kind of scope, from your first tour, something like 04, for the next 10 years or so, you guys would release an album every one and a half years or so, but you especially if you count solo projects, yeah. along with touring, I mean, that's, that's pretty huge. That, that pace, that it's, it's more than just ambitious. That's a lot. Yeah, but let's go back to the even beginning of the conversation of saying, here's a worthless child in his own right, in his own mind, mm -hmm. to society, you know, to to some of the people around him, from fellow peers to guidance counselors. So, so he, you know, here's this worthless entity with no identity, with no camaraderie, no gang, all this stuff. Suddenly, you thrust him into a success, mm -hmm. and you show him, a, a just you let him just taste and see that like he's not a complete failure, mm -hmm. and that he belongs somewhere to a system, to a to a whole, to a unit, to a team, and then on a greater scale. Now I'm friends with all these other guys that are doing so are, are so impassioned for the same thing and feeling a part of their gang. Mm -hmm. I mean, you could not stop me. You could not, you know, it, I was an, I was a wrecking ball and that's not a positive thing. You know, it took a toll on my marriage early on mm -hmm. where I put Amberlynn first above her. Mm -hmm. And at moments, perhaps before God, you know, I don't, you know, it all kind of interweaves in, in there, but, you know, definitely in my heart it, at moments, it definitely was like, who's, who's on the throne of my heart? And perhaps it becomes me. So yes, yeah, it, on the outside, oh my gosh, you started a nonprofit, you did this, 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 and this, and it sounds like, oh, look at that, that's awesome. But internally, like I was doing it because I had never tasted that. I had never seen that. And so I was just living out, you know, I was stampeding because finally I belonged. Finally, I had purpose and reason and accolades and there was no one telling me you suck or you'll never mount to anything and, and you're no good and you're, you know, there was all that was behind me. And so I am, uh, you know, I was making up for lost time in my head, in my heart. So you got a taste and yeah. it exposed that hunger that was, that yeah, was there it, already. Yeah, it exposed wow. a lot of stuff. It was, it was, it was dark, it was yeah. dark because yeah, it was done in, for good purpose and done in good reason. And, yeah. and at the time I would have justified it and said like, you know, listen to me, you, you, you don't have to be a failure. You can conquer. But really, I was literally just holding that. I don't want to call it an inner child. I was just holding that child of who I was and just saying, you know what? It all turns out. It'll all work out. It'll all work out. Wow. And that came through in my music. It came in a lot of positive ways. Definitely. Um, it came in through positive by the lyrics. All the, you know, if you took a if there was an aggregator of my lyrics over my life, mm -hmm. I think I think if you just narrowed it down, it would have been dark as the way light is a place. Like it is, it could feel hopeless. There is hope. So you're you're trying to heal in this enormously difficult environment that's also yeah. stripping away, exposing new things yeah. as, every day. Yeah. Uh, so if if I were to think of it again as a non-musician, health, wealth, and relationships in music. You you just said we, this is crazy fast paced, exposed to new things, admitting that it wasn't all good. Health, how do you keep your head and your body engaged for a, a decade plus of this pace, of this increasing exposure to people and fame and how do you do that? I think at the, at the most, at the most vulnerable moments of those years is when I learned the most. Like when I, call, I had to call my best friend and say, I'm failing, I suck, I'm not as good of a human as I thought I was, I need you out here. When I was vulnerable with my wife and saying, I'm putting Amberlynn before you, when I was vulnerable with God and saying, at the end of the day, this is all egocentricism, I'm just trying to, you know, to, 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 you know, to tell myself I am okay, I am a good human, I am, you know. So there was a lot of moments where it was just, but I think those were brutal, honest moments. And so for me, that came out through the time through seeing a counselor, through getting, you know, that I, someone just said the other day, and I, I don't even know who I wish I could give them the 
respect that they deserve for the quote, but they said, it's okay to have Jesus and a, and a therapist at the same time. And I it's appreciate that. It's great advice. Yeah. So would that be your, if you were to have, if I was to make you give advice on health, wealth, and relationships, yep. any of those, would that be your advice to say, look, look in the mirror, take an, take an honest stop. Dude, honest stop. Ugly, whatever, take it honest, yeah. and then let someone else do it too. Yeah, Therapist but, but when, you, when you look in the mirror and you're honest with yourself, write it all down in a journal like you got to like you have to show yourself and 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 if you feel like burning it at the end of the day burn that journal but you Do like it. you've got to be real with yourself i struggle with this i suck at this and it's okay you're okay you're you're fine it's going to be okay at the end of the day progress and work hard at, at, at overcoming the stuff that you're that you're that 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 you feel are are downfalls but if you're not you're not capable of giving yourself an honest assessment Oh, man, you've got a lot of work to do, you know, and, and, and yeah. And, and, and feel free to hand that over to a psychologist or a Christian counselor or your pastor, whomever. But there's got to be someone on your team that's rooting you on. This, this life was not meant to be walked alone. So to, to chart just a little bit for folks, uh, 03, 04, you have your first album as Amberlynn. You have your first tour. Uh, oh, uh, you never take friendship happens and like oh five or so oh seven cities comes out and and suddenly it's top 20 on billboard 200 and then a few years later new surrender is out and feel good drag is number one on all songs mm -hmm. you had said when you showed up in seattle you felt like this is we did something here yeah but was there another time as as it got bigger, as as you you guys got bigger, was there another time after recording, after a show where you sat down and you or all the guys said, you made it? No, made it. that never That's, happened. No, it didn't. Because the the cool the the blessing of all of it was that our first show was in front of six people, mm -hmm. the second show was in front of fifteen people, and the third show was a, and it just it was like this, you know. Yeah, there was a few blips like you know when we got signed to a major you know, and stuff like that, or there's a few blips, but for the most part, it didn't do this, you yeah. know, and it wasn't, you know, like it wasn't drastic. It, it was like the slow, gradual to where you, oh, you barely felt it, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, definitely when the, the song went number one, it was, it was insane. But the fact of the matter is that it came out on the chart and it was like number 71 and it went to 50. And it, so it was like so a very, it. it was, yeah. And it yeah. spent like, I think a total of like 56, it set a record for most weeks on a chart, 56. But see what I'm saying? It was like this slow burn. So it wasn't this overnight, you know, success story, which is great. I think, I think anything worth, you know, anything worth accomplishing, it has to have a fight attached to it. It can't be just handed to you because you won't appreciate it. So we appreciated every second. I can tell you where it was when it went number one. I can tell you where it was when it signed to a major. I, can, I mean, I remember those moments. But the beauty of it is just, man, just that trudge, you know, forward. Mm -hmm. It was, it was worthwhile. At the time, it was frustrating because you knew how much effort and time and money and everything that poured into it, you saw it, but, and you didn't feel like there was a lot of return. But then when you look back, you're like, oh God, mm -hmm. oh my gosh, like we are so much farther than we were a year ago. So even after a decade or more of hours and hours of recorded music with Anne Berlin, you had, you had things you hadn't gotten to say or you had things that you had learned you wanted to say that need an, an outlet. Yeah. And that was, that became Anchor and Braille. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's been, I think, three. Yeah, three records. records right, writing my fourth currently, yep. Exciting. Yep. Got the scoop. There you go. Um, so you've got this project that, it, did you feel like that was your, uh, not that you had compromised it necessarily, but I'm not expressing my identity the way I want to. I'm not expressing Steven through this music and as the way I want to. And this became that. What, were there other times that your identity was challenged in that same kind of way, whether as as a believer, as a musician, as a just as a, as a man? I mean, as a man. Yeah, I absolutely. Because the thing about what no one tells you in a band is that you are living out a Peter Pan fantasy. You are expected to be young, like as far as like I'm not even talking about young, just young minded as well as being young, as well as like everything is free. Everything is there is a I mean as much alcohol as you want, as much drugs, as much sex, as much as, as much everything, and no one cares. Mm -hmm. They give you a free pass. They go, well, this is, this is, well, this is what his profession is. But it's rocking. You know, so. I had, this is the craziest thing. I had a, a friend, uh, you know, and, and he, and he said he went to the doctor and told, and, and he was in a band and he told the doctor, honestly, how much he drank. 
And the doctor's response was, oh yeah, well, you're in a band. And I was like, oh my gosh, that's not right. You don't, and then that, but that, but take that as a microcosm as far as the whole, how you're viewed. You can make stupid financial decisions because always, oh, man, he's a rock star. You can make, you can make every type of crazy decision. You know? So being, but going back to your, but asking me about man, the problem is when you get out of being in a band, you'll see band members disappear from social media, from life from friendships, they are gone because they, in their heads, they were 19, 19, 35. Wow. You know what I'm saying? And they're just like, oh my gosh, I got, what the crap is LinkedIn? Like what, what is a degree? How do I even go back to, do I go to community college? Where, what's a transcript? What is a real nine to five? What is an office? What is, you know, monday.com? What is Asana? What is all these things? Wait, I'm 35 and I have zero, what, a 401k? What's a mutual fund? They have no clue because the entire time this was, this is what was expected, so this is what they did. And so, yeah, their closet's full of awesome leather jackets, my friend, and maybe a few cars and motorcycle and all the other things that, you know, maybe a house. But now what? Like, you're, you don't have a business manager that's doing your taxes. You don't have a business manager that's telling you, like, you know, well, you know, or paying your bills. So you suddenly, you have to, life just comes, you know, to a, it just, figure out what a man is and you got ready, set, go. Were there things? I'm sure there are. What are some things that you draw from your experience in music, your experience in the spotlight, your experience on stage that, that matter now, that you bring in now that are advantages to you? And what you're doing now, and and even stepping into the ministry role, advantages then that that kind of culminate over into this. I think that special when when I meet people that are working on their dreams, that are working on their goals or or visions, or they're entrepreneurs. That that there's some type of like okay, you know, let's talk on a, a level playing field. Whether you're successful or you're not, I've been to both stages of of that that kind of journey of where you're heading and let me help you get to the next place. And, uh, I, I, and I think the biggest part is not me saying, well, look what I did, more saying, look how I failed and avoid this. Mm -hmm. You need an accountability partner. You need a strong community. You need open communication with your wife. You need, you know, whether it's a psychologist or a therapist, mm -hmm. whatever that's, some, let's, let's talk about some pitfalls that I faced and let me show you where I failed and where I didn't think I was gonna fail and, and, but I turned a corner and then suddenly it was staring me in the face. And it, it just, I think the failures preach louder than the, you know, the success stories and the numbers. So you feel some responsibility for, of, of uh, call it stewardship of your success to pass that along. To oh life. man, absolutely, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, Simon Sinek said, you know, in a book called Know Your Why, you know, and he was you know, explaining the reason that each one of us need to know, but I think I walked away from it saying, listen, I wake up each and every day wanting the best possible version of everyone around me. And whether that's an entrepreneur endeavor, whether that's someone's relationship with Jesus Christ, whether that's gonna look different for each person, but I wanna find out who they are and figure out how to get them to the next level. So compare for me the impact you have had as a musician, continue to have as a musician, fourth, fourth record on the way, uh, to the impact you're having now. You go from thousands of people at a time millions of records sold, things like this, to what you're doing now. Compare that impact for me and how it looks to the people you're talking to and how it feels and looks to you. Well, I think a lot of times in the band, since I was success driven, sometimes to be honest, I would look out and see numbers, you know, and I would see, because you can't really, you know, there's a few faces you could recognize in the crowd, but for the most part, you're in a new city every time, every, every, every tour or date and um, new town. And, um, and, and what, what I think I've gleaned from ministry is that those faces are now stories. You know, I look out and, and I'm, I'm preaching a sermon or I'm leading worship or I'm, you know, just talking for stage or whatever the case might be. And getting to know these people on a one-on-one -on -one personal relationship, and it, it, they become stories, they become real. You know, especially when I'm doing counseling sessions myself and somebody comes in and they're struggling with this problem or this addiction or whatever the case might be my heart can just break towards this one person. In a band, like I said, there's a lot of thematic, you know, in my lyrics, there's a lot of thematic themes I was trying to get across or stories or, or my failures or whatever the case might be to help people. 
but that was just kind of just like taking an Uzi and just trying to, you know, like just, you know, but with ministry, it's more just like one-on-one. It's just like, it's not so, you know, it's not so spread out and, and just trying to just cast a whole bunch of seeds in many different directions. It's more just kind of like, here, let me plant into your life. Let me see, let me, I want to, I want to see what you're growing. How can I invest that so it's the best possible harvest? So I think that's the differentiation, but something that I've taken over. And now that I go back and I tour with Amberlin, I view people so differently. You touched on this a little bit. Um, I'm going to phrase it from this. You tweeted recently uh, oh, no. something to the effect of you were with your daughter somewhere and she saw oh, one, one of the guys from the bands and yeah. she said, she said, that, that's the drummer from Amberlin. Yeah. And you, you said something like, I literally tuck you in every night. So that happened. Do you feel, do you feel in a sense that you've, oh, and you just referenced, we're sitting here today, we're something like three weeks or so removed from, you guys just played House of Blues Orlando. Yeah. So we're not talking about a small, that's a, that's a real show. Yeah. Right. Uh, But do you feel in a sense that you've traded the spotlight for something else or did you outgrow the spotlight? And now there's things that are not, not in terms of status, but in terms of your focus Cause that's a, that's an interesting yeah. balance to try to play. And you've got this weird kind of unique ability that, yeah, we can go play a real show yeah. as, awesome. a, as a side gig. Well, it's on our terms now. Yeah. It's on our terms. It, to, to me, Amberlin represents quantity of life. It's like, man, fun, fame, fortune, you know, just notoriety, all this stuff. And it's all right here. And then on this side, I have quality of life. Mm. And last night I went home and I played plop the pig or some dumb game where you put these chips and you this pig explodes and the kids love it and then i read them two stories and then i tucked them into bed mm-hmm. that to me is quality of life you know what i'm saying my wife wanted to watch an office rerun so that's what we did you know like it, it and it sounds almost mundane like oh okay that's just wow but to me like i missed out on a decade of that you know i missed out on a lot of that not not so much my kids but my wife i missed out on a lot of those moments and so you know i you know just yesterday being able to to meet with different people and share my you know share share my struggles and their struggles and we were back and forth and all that like that to me is like it's quality of life it's real life it's it's tangible it's it's uh it it makes sense and it feel and it's it feels like on a holistic approach to life. Okay, so last question. By, by any real metric, you've been successful. Again, you, you, you made money on the road. You've taken on something hard here. Uh, by all accounts, a great church that you got to be, be a part of, get to lead. Given that, what do you think it is that let you succeed where so many other people fail? I think, you know, I wish I had a power animal that encompassed this, but no one's been able to give it to me yet. Um, You're, are you maybe, saying like a spirit animal? Yeah, like, a, like a something. Okay, I, like, this, I, is, this is our project yeah, now, yeah, your yeah, spirit animal. Is. But I don't think, I don't, I've met very few people as tenacious and determined as I was. Hmm. Like I, I'm not the smartest man in the room, even this minute. I'm not the smart, I'm not the most creative. You know, I'm not the most this, this, I'm not the best songwriter. I'm not the, you know, I mean, just name every attribute mm-hmm. of humanity and I will never be in the top 50% of. Mm-hmm. But what I can say is that I was tenacious and I was determined and I, I was just a bulldozer into what I felt like the dream to, to figure it out and accomplish it. Stephen Christian, singer, songwriter, rock star, husband, father, pastor. Yes. Thank you, man. Thank you for your time. Thank you for sharing. I appreciate it.